Coming up, the chief UK Brexit negotiator, the underqualified, overpromoted Boris Johnson sycophant David Frost, this week declared in the House of Lords that rising temperatures due to climate change are likely to be beneficial for Britain. For what reason did this failed whisky salesman proffer this facile, simplistic and ill-informed opinion? Simples, because according to him, more people have died of cold than of heat in this country. This is the calibre of intellect that delivered the dreadful Brexit deal that even Leave voters aren't happy with. And the common denominator between climate change scepticism and Brexit? Campaigns on both these issues were coordinated by dark money funded pressure groups in Tufton Street. I'd really appreciate it if you'd hit the like button, subscribe and above all share a link to this video with your social media contacts. I'm going to show you some video footage of a visibly nervous, sweaty looking David Frost speaking in the House of Lords earlier this week. But before you watch it, I just want to remind you that Frost is a trustee of Tufton Street Outfit, the Global Warming Policy Foundation, the GWPF. Frost claims the GWPF gives an objective view of climate change. In fact, it's purely a climate science denial group. You might wonder which vested interests are funding it. And it won't surprise you to hear that this Tufton Street pressure group has received funding from the Sarah Scaife Foundation, which holds $30 million worth of shares in energy companies, including Exxon and Chevron. And the Donors Trust, which has been used to channel funding from the Koch family, who have spent more than Exxon Mobil in order to fund organizations and projects questioning mainstream science behind man-made climate change. Greenpeace has put that total funding at over $88 million. The founder and honorary president of GWPF until his death earlier this year was none other than the celebrated Brexitist loon, ex-Tory Chancellor Nigel Lawson. During the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow in 2021, Lawson declared that global warming is not a problem. He also defended fossil fuels and falsely claimed CO2's principal effect is the growth of plants. Contrary to Lord Frost's claims of objectivity, GWPF's campaigning arm, Net Zero Watch, is urging the government to recommit to fossil fuels in response to the energy crisis, calling for a new fleet of coal-fired power stations, plus more oil and gas, including through fracking. Frost has been involved in all this, signing GWPF-linked joint letters calling for the UK's fracking ban to be lifted. Back in October, MPs Caroline Lucas of the Greens, the Lib Dems Leila Moran and Labour's Clive Lewis wrote to the Charity Commission to highlight potential breaches of charity law by GWPF. These included its spending of hundreds of thousands of pounds on one-sided so-called research and its financial relationship with the non-charitable subsidiary Net Zero Watch. In response, the Charity Commission confirmed it was reviewing the evidence submitted. The lobbying efforts of organisations who deny a climate emergency are not, in my opinion, charitable activities and shouldn't be subsidised with our taxes. So anyway, I hope all this gives you some context in which to place this video footage of Brexit hard man, frosty than no man, giving his somewhat nervous speech to the House of Lords this week. At the moment, seven times as many people die from cold as from heat as in Britain. What? Did you see that tongue? Is Frost perhaps one of David Icke's lizard people? Rising temperatures are likely to be beneficial. The Government Actuary Department, no less, wrote in April this year, and I quote, it is the low winter temperatures that have a greater effect on the number of deaths. Since the start of the millennium, a decline in deaths from cold temperature periods has more than offset any increase in the number of deaths associated with warmer temperature over the same period. And meanwhile, spend the manageable sums that we need to on adaptation so we can adjust to the perfectly manageable consequences of slowly rising temperatures as they emerge. So let's just go through that again. At the moment, seven times as many people die from cold as from heat as in Britain. A few things about this statement. First, he says, at the moment. Some news for you, Frosty. 
at the moment is about as good as it gets, with every genuine climate expert saying we ain't seen nothing yet. Second, what a bizarre way of contextualising climate change by looking at deaths from cold compared to deaths by heat on this, up till now, cold, wet island in isolation. British isolationism. Just like this guy's same disastrous isolationist approach to Brexit. Remember as well, he was speaking as much of Southern Europe endured its hottest July in half a century with scorching temperatures of up to 45 degrees centigrade and British tourists having to flee for their lives in roads and Corfu because of wildfires. Rising temperatures are likely to be beneficial. What a completely vacuous statement. So there will be less British deaths from the cold perhaps, very likely to be more than offset by deaths from heat in the coming years. Lord Devon, who you may best know as Tory John Selwyn Gummer, former Secretary of State for the Environment and until recently Chairman of the UK's Independent Committee on Climate Change, and someone whose knowledge of climate exceeds the ignoramus David Frost by a factor of 10 million to one, commented, I don't think the families of people who died because of heat are very much cheered by the fact that there are fewer people dying because of cold. But rising temperatures impact every aspect of human existence. You can't just tally up the numbers of deaths from cold and heat. This is like climate change analysis by a group of nine-year-olds. And that's probably insulting many nine-year-olds that I know. Lord Debham went on to say on Sky News, there are several people around who frankly are telling lies about it. They don't want to face this. There are three newspapers which every day pretend that we don't have to fight climate change. That will be the Tory backing Daily Mail, Daily Express and Daily Telegraph. There are individuals whose voices are being magnified instead of the sensible statement which is simply this. The science tells us it's getting worse and worse and there is one way to fight it which is to get down to net zero. Back to the hard of thinking frost. The government actuary department, no less, wrote in April this year, and I quote, it is the low winter temperatures that have a greater effect on the number of deaths. Since the start of the millennium, a decline in deaths from cold temperature periods has more than offset any increase in the number of deaths associated with warmer temperature over the same period. Again, Frost is looking at the past and not considering the effects from this point on. This is ancient history in terms of the current rate of climate change. And in this particular instance, that history cannot be used to extrapolate the effects of so-called doom loops in climate change in the near future. But back to Frost. And meanwhile, spend the manageable sums that we need to on adaptation so we can adjust to the perfectly manageable consequences of slowly rising temperatures as they emerge. Perfectly manageable? Tell that to the people whose houses are built on floodplains or those on the east coast whose homes have fallen victim to coastal erosion and rising sea levels. Lord Larry Whitty, a Labour peer who, unlike Lord Frost, has spent most of his career dealing with environmental issues during his time in DEFRA, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. He scoffed at Frost's childish analysis, saying, The idea that we can have a choice between mitigation and adaptation is absurd. We need both. Interestingly, Whitty also referred to the recent by-election in Uxbridge and South Ryslip, saying, as to the current furore in the newspapers, after a by-election in which 250 people voted the wrong way, we have the pressure on the leaders of our two main parties to back off from their commitment to green policies and to climate change. I find that absolutely absurd. And he's right. Some particularly dim Tory MPs have been calling for Rishi Sunak to delay climate pledges after the party narrowly held on to Uxbridge and South Ryslip in last week's by-election. And it gives the credit to the Tories' opposition to the expansion of London's ultra-low emission zone, the ULES scheme. Even though the original scheme was the brainchild of Tory London Mayor Boris Johnson, and even though Sadiq Khan was pretty much forced into the expansion as a condition of post-pandemic government funding for London. Unfortunately, Labour failed spectacularly to get that story across to the majority of the Uxbridge electorate. But again, issues such as these, whilst no doubt important, pale into insignificance by some of the larger changes that are heading our way. 
The Right Honourable Professor the Lord A.J. Kakar, PC, is Professor of Surgery at University College London, amongst many other things, and he has stated that we will see more vector-related diseases, mosquito-related diseases such as Zika virus, West Nile fever, and indeed potentially malaria in the future if the predictions are correct. I wonder if Frosty even considered deaths from these diseases in his calculations. Of course not. The Tory former Environment Minister Lord Deben, John Selwyn Gummer, said, We do have a certainty here. The weather is changing. It's changing dramatically. And that means that we can't talk about deaths as Lord Frost did. The fact of the matter is, we have to deal with these problems. Green Party peer Baroness Jones of Molescombe said Lord Frost had promoted denialist tropes and right-wing conspiracy theories in his speech. Ah, sounds like Brexit all over again. On a slightly brighter note, Tory Energy Minister Lord Callanan said, Adaptation and net zero in fact go hand in hand. Achieving net zero actually requires adaptation. We have a huge opportunity to make the substantial net zero investments that are resilient to current and future climate change risks, and doing so can, of course, prevent future higher costs. And here's the kicker from this government minister. Let me, for the avoidance of any doubt, confirm that delivering net zero is of course vitally important to this government. Let's just hope he's right and that Rishi Sunak is not about to take the low road and scupper progress towards net zero just to please 250 voters in Uxbridge and South Ryslip. On the costs and benefits of climate action, Frost noted estimates that cutting UK emissions to net zero would require significant investment of about 1-2% to of GDP a year. Funnily enough, he didn't mention the 4% hit to GDP each year as a direct consequence of the disastrous Brexit deal that he himself negotiated. Just by remaining an EU member would have provided as much as four times the funds required to pay for the entire net zero investment. He also conveniently forgot to mention studies looking at the negative economic effects of unmitigated climate breakdown. 16 years ago, the Stern Review found that the benefits of strong and early action far outweigh the economic costs of not acting. Multiple recent peer-reviewed reports support that finding. And as Frost liked quoting figures from the Government Actuary Department, let me quote figures from the Government's Office for Budget Responsibility, who recently said, Unmitigated climate change would ultimately have catastrophic economic and fiscal consequences. Do you know, I almost envy Frost's limited intellectual capacity, which allows him to remain blissfully ignorant and thus pretty nonchalant about the perfectly manageable consequences of slowly rising temperatures. Or is it not a lack of comprehension, but more to do with what his financial masters are telling him to say? His Tufton Street connections through his trusteeship at the Global Warming Policy Foundation would certainly suggest that in this instance, dark money talks. Meanwhile, here on planet Earth, the world experiences its hottest month on record, and as I speak, weather extremes are currently impacting each of the world's seven continents like never before.